Welcome to the Clarity Compressed Podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly, and today we have an interview that I've been wanting to do for a really, really, really long time. We get to talk with New York Times bestseller, founder of StoryBrand, the one and only Donald Miller. We're making our way through the fog of life, and Clarity is understanding where we are on the map. You are here. <laughs> Let the good times roll. This is Clarity Compressed. Okay, today's moment of clarity is this. People don't remember the things that you had to do. They remember the things that you did not have to do. The premise of this is that when people expect that something is your job to do it, they don't remember it because the cashier at the checkout is supposed to remember all my items, right? I don't remember her for that or him for that. However, if they give my kids something, like if they give the baby something to occupy him, so he's crying, you know, so he's not crying, well, I'm going to remember that. If I do a sales transaction with someone and I remember they're an Eagles fan and I give them an Eagles hat, it costs me 10 bucks. But if I just sold them a car, they'll always remember that I was nice enough to give them that Eagles hat. In this time when there are a lot of things and we're all working in different places and from home and people are stressed out and we have all these different, you know, um, crisis personalities going on, think about what you can do for somebody that you didn't really have to do, but it would really surprise and delight them and make them feel either a little more safe, a little more comfortable, maybe just a little bit happier and have a little joy in their lives because they will always remember that. So that's the moment of clarity. People don't remember the things that you have to do. They remember the things you didn't have to do. I'm so excited for what he's going to show me. Hurry up and show me Paul's pick. All right, Paul's pick for this week is this cool little device. This is a Loom Cube. This is not a sponsored post, just so you know. I wish Loom Cube, if you want to sponsor this, I will gladly say it's sponsored and give you props anyway. But this is a little light. It's a little light that I bought because uh, somebody advertised me and targeted me well on Instagram. It's a little light and it's really great. It's magnetic. I can stick it right to the microphone. Um, It also comes with these little covers or gels so you can have soft light. And what this does is uses this suction cup, sticks to your computer. I mean, you can use it for other things. And now your Zooms and your online meetings can look a lot better. So you don't have to have like a light set up like I have. Um, all you need is this little loom cube. It's like 50 bucks and it's extremely portable, battery powered. It gets very bright and it's magnetic. And it's my pick for this week because it's something that is relevant to just about anybody who is still working because we want to see your face. We don't like it when you're a real shadowy figure. So that's my pick loom cube, L U M E C U B E. Get one so I can see your face. So I'm going to use this interview now as an excuse to, to, you know, believe in myself that Don and I are now friends. Uh, we talk about this a little in the show. So we're friends now because uh, we've done a podcast interview. But the story actually starts on a really sad note. I mean, not an ultimately sad note. But um, so the sad part is that pre-COVID-19, I was slated to fly down to Nashville with my good friend and colleague, the one and only S.T. Davis, and we were going to shoot this interview live in Nashville, in person. I was so excited about that. And then obviously, that's not possible right now because of the pandemic. But there is a silver lining, very similar to a lot of things right now, that you know it's easy to mourn what was lost. But I think because, because there's this pandemic, because we had the conversation over Skype, and you know Don kind of dialed in from the upstairs room of this new property he and his wife were building out. Um, I think it was a more, you know, I I dare to say like a more uh, loose or intimate um, conversation because everybody's a little bit more relaxed or where they feel completely comfortable. And uh, so I think that the benefit is we were really able to have a more candid conversation and that you'll see that. So um, Don, just to give you a little framework. So Don, uh, uh, New York Times bestseller. His first bestseller was a book called Blue Like Jazz uh, a long time ago. I don't know if it was like 14, 15 years ago. But I've been a fan of his for a long time. I read that book. I went to the first conference uh, that he ever put on. It was called Storyline. And you know we talk about that in the interview coming up. But I've also been a student of his framework, the story brand framework. It really helped me um, understand communication, understand story narrative, and the power of story, and why, as humans... 
basically story is just a sense-making device for us. When we hear stories, and this, this goes and expands into songs and songwriting that's, that tells stories, all of these things, we connect with them because they help us make sense of something in our lives. So when we deploy that in our marketing and messaging, it's extremely powerful when we do it in a way that is uh, precise and a way that is empathetic. And so Don and I talk about that. We talk about um, what small businesses should be doing right now in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, we talk about propping up the middle class. We talk about Don's future Senate run. Uh, we talk about a whole lot of things. And I'm so excited to uh, share this interview with you. It was so great and uh, just a, a great moment for me to be able to sit with him for, for half an hour and discuss some of these things. I know you're going to learn a lot. I know you're going to get a lot of insights like I did. And for me, honestly, it was just a way to get some free consulting. Um, so I think we executed well on it. I think you're going to get a lot of insight. I hope you get a lot of value and ultimately can understand some perspective on where you are on the map right now. So here's my interview with the one and only Donald Miller. Don, thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, some of your time today. My pleasure. So um, listeners of this podcast know that that um, I'm a fan. So similar to like when you had Damon John on, this is really just an excuse for me now to pretend like Don and I are cool. Like we just hang out. We um, are cool. We are hanging out. <laughs> we are. It's exactly, we are hanging out. Um, so go. like we go back. I'm going to set this up. So going back uh, all the way back to Blue Like Jazz, I was a fan of the book. And then all the way through like Business Made Simple and even um, – or story brand and also business made simple. And, and really your work has made a profound impact um, on the way I think, on the way I approach uh, messaging and marketing and, and actually on my business as well. So I want to start off just by thanking you for doing all that work because it really has made a profound impact. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for even being interested. I'm glad it's helpful. And, and so this next thing now is kind of an on-ramp. So um, one thing that I think a lot of people don't know, but it's also a connection point that you and I have, um, is that I was at your very first conference. It was called Storyline. And wow. the reason I'm bringing that up, so my wife and I went out and we were looking for kind of a reset in our lives. And the framework, uh, just to, to summarize it, is that you were trying to help people see that uh, understand what a narrative is and the different points of narrative and conflict and how that applies to your life so that it could frame up your life in terms of uh, a story. So you could realize and kind of see yourself as part of the story. And I remember one thing that you said, and, and really it, it brings us right to the situation we're in, that when something happens, right, nobody cares about a story about somebody who doesn't really want anything and doesn't really do anything to get what he doesn't really want. Right. And when something challenging or tough happens in our lives. I remember in that conference, you said, I want you to say to yourself, plot twist, right? <laughs> Just <laughs> right. as a way to frame it up in your mind, like, okay, let me think about this a little bit outside of the situation that I'm emotionally deep in right now. And so I want to just use that little point to say, we're in the middle of one heck of a plot twist right now. I mean, you could, you know, it, it, it is the stuff of major motion pictures, you know, in fact, I think if you did a global pandemic in a major motion picture, people would say that's too far. You can, you know, stick to one continent or one country. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that would never happen. And uh, so it, true. it's really amazing. So um, tell me, just check in a little bit. Like there's major plot twists. It's disrupted all of our lives. Um, how is your business and how is your family faring through all this? Like what adjustments are you making? How are you doing? We're great. Uh you know, we we are grieving for uh, the obviously the people who are dying of the disease, uh, the virus. We're grieving for all the scientists uh, who are having to figure out the solutions. Um, you have more people now. You know, the, the number of people who die every year by suicide has been reached in a, by April. I didn't know that. So, no, it's it's a very very serious problem. Uh, if you look at loss of life, it's more serious than the actual virus. Now, the virus could be worse if we were to unleash the economy and let everything go than the virus. would. So, sure. you know, that's not a criticism of the moves that we have made. It's just saying that we're solving a problem by creating and, and by solving it, we're creating other problems that are very, very serious. But if we don't solve the problem, then the original problem is bigger than the problem we've created. You know, it's an algorithm. Yes. That's, it's no fun to think about. Uh, so I, I, I don't envy any leadership who's having to deal with this. Uh, and, 
and but I think there are better ways to deal with it than what it's being dealt with. So I, you know, all of that, but uh, we grieve that. But you know, personally, mm-hmm. in my personal psyche, and my 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 wife and we we basically believe that when challenge strikes, it's also an opportunity. And uh, every every bit of growth that happens in story and every bit of growth that happens in life happens because of pain. And without pain, you just can't grow. I mean, it's the whole system is designed that way. If you want to, if you want giant biceps, you got to go, go, go experience a lot of pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. It wasn't by choice, but every time it happens, you just have to say, well, we're going to get a lot out of this. There's no question. So our company in the midst of this has grown. Uh, Our profit margins have gone up. Uh, Our, we are moving faster toward building the future than we were before. And it's because the mentality of the 24 people on my team is this is an opportunity Never waste a good crisis. Yeah. And so that's a political slogan, right? Yeah, that's how we're facing it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say that we're enjoying it because we see so much pain that's going on in the world. But we're certainly uh, redeeming it in the best way we can. That's a great framework to redeem it and, like, just face it head on. Um, yeah, we- you know, the, the going through pain, it's a theme I, I've labeled. I call it the transaction of growth. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's always a transaction. Everybody talks about, you know, I want to go here. I want to do this. I want to have big biceps. I want to have a successful business. I want to write a book. Um, but then when you realize like it's a trend, like it takes something, you have to give something to get it. And, and this is that, that time, um, especially in our businesses. Now you are in touch with thousands of small businesses. Like you've really invested a lot of your blood, sweat and tears into helping small businesses and, and sole proprietors and entrepreneurs really improve themselves and educate themselves, especially through your, your recent platform. Um, I think it's important, your perspective on this. Now, a lot of what you've talked about over the last years and agencies and marketers and right we talk about getting things that are formulaic so that you know we can work through this system and that if you follow these steps you're going to get this result and um, I heard you say on I think it was your last episode of your podcast you said you know if you haven't done the work to build a sales funnel if you haven't done the work to this point like you you can still start but now you're in really big trouble and so we've always had these formulas but now what I see is a pivot towards a faster reactionary, a response necessary for small businesses, and you might not have time to follow a formula. So what do you think small businesses should and could be doing in this time? What is the the most important thing now? Pivot. I mean, you just have to ask yourselves, uh, how can we make money during this crisis? Uh, I mean, that's the, the most important thing. You know, I, we're, we're about to film a, a course called Zero to Ten, and it's how we went from zero to 10 million. Mm-hmm. And we're actually reverse engineering how we did it. Because we, we did 13 million last year. We'll do 15 this year, even amidst this crisis. Mm-hmm. And the, the way we did it, you know, everybody would say, well, you got to think about execution. You got to think about sales. You got to think about marketing. You got to think about culture. You got to think. None of that is true. Uh, the, the way you build a $10 million business is you absolutely obsess about sales the entire time. Wow. <laughs> and, that's it. You don't sleep. You don't eat. You just go, we didn't make enough money. Today. That's how you do it. And you know, anybody who's, who's building a business and they're thinking about culture, there's one reason. They have venture capital. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? So any, hold on. Let me drill into that for a second. So anyone who's building a business and is thinking about culture is doing it because they have venture capital? They, it, it's a luxury. Now, I'm not saying culture is not important. Sure. Please don't get me wrong. But, uh, you, you know, I've got friends who, you know, they start a business and they're, they're, they've got their, you know, in the first year they've got their logo out and it's really beautiful and then they're releasing all sorts of swag and uh-huh. that's called venture capital. That's called, I don't need to make money because <laughs> right? anybody else is going, we got to make money. So I look at it like, like, uh, you know, I've got a fireplace in this house that, uh, has a natural gas, uh, burner under it. So, you know, you turn on the natural gas, and you throw a log on there. That's how that's how people <laughs> with venture capital start a business. The rest yep. of us are going in the backyard looking for the smallest piece of kindling and a little piece. Right. Of- if this goes out, I'm going to like it's my last match. Right. If this doesn't light, I'm in trouble. That's exactly it. And so I believe that even if you ha- have private equity or venture capital or you ha- you had some money to build your business, you, you still should obsess about sales and marketing. You've got to get those orders coming in and a, and a good 
you know, the orders of the fire and you got to keep that fire going. And then once the fire is big, you act as your own venture capital Mm -hmm. and you can put a new product that's a whole log on there without even using any kindling because that fire is hot enough. Then you start thinking about culture well, what and you start thinking about, wait, you know, we are, we got a problem. With, we got a problem with turnover, right? So now we got a problem with turnover. I got to solve my culture problem because we got a bunch of jerks running around in this office. But until then, I, you got to get- I heard fire. you're great at giving feedback, by the way. I heard you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Don's last podcast. It's hilarious. Well, yeah. so like, well, let me push, push up back on that for a second, because I think when yeah. you, in my, in my observation of like story brand and my, me coming into kind of like this ecosystem, you know, I talk a lot about brand, right. And we're, we call ourselves a brand first agency. And, um, just recently when I was at, I came to the mission statement made simple, uh, workshop that you did. And, you know, I, I, I bugged you a hundred times and saying, how's this? And you said, that doesn't make any sense. And I was like, crap, right? I thought I had it perfect. I was like, Don just told me it doesn't make any sense. Like, oh, so, but. Well, it, I'm not God. I don't know everything. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. But it didn't make any sense. You were right. <laughs> I'm not saying you weren't right. And I, I kept working it. And what I, what I was able to distill it down to this for a theme, and it's caught on within my organization and it's resonated with customers. And it's this, business is more meaningful when people connect on a human level. And that premise is why we take a brand first approach to sales, a brand first approach to culture. So the way that comes back to what I'm about to say is, or what you just said, is that you have to focus obsessively on sales. But even with story brand and stuff like that, there was like this inciting event or this inciting thought that you believe that the story framework is how we should market better. So like... Tell me about how you get from like that thought and that inspiration where like, I'm going to be the story. I'm going to hang my hat on the story hook and then get it from that point because you can just have a sales driven organization and all you think about is sales, right? And you start, how can I make money? And the business actually starts there. It's like, I don't know, maybe I'll sell a uh, drop ship, you know, drop ship products from Taiwan, right? And you can start a business on sales with no culture, but something like what you've done with story brand, something that what I do. And I think a lot of small businesses, they start with this concept of, I believe in this. Yes. So how, how does that go from, I believe in this to getting it to like, now we have to focus on sales. What does that look like for you? Well, for me, I think the, the, the reality is that, you know, I'd used the elements of story, story structure, the study of story for years to write books, mostly mm-hmm. memoirs. And they, they, the power of it to keep you turning the page. Mm-hmm. And so it was really through um, understanding, okay, how can I use this to grow my business, to get people to pay attention to my business? And once I started using those elements, it was like the difference between an excavator and a shovel. And so we did that for ourselves and then thought, wait a second, we've got an excavator here. We can pull into somebody's backyard and dig a pool in three days rather than three years. Right. And uh, and nobody else has figured it out. And so for me, you know, it, it was a belief in that framework. I mean, a belief, mm-hmm. uh, not because we thought it was neat or cool, but because it was effective. Right. It it's worked. the truth. It's, right. It's the truth. Yeah. Right. It's just the truth. And so, uh, but then that, that alone is not enough, right? You can't mm-hmm. just go, I believe in this, but you have to actually say, okay, what problem does this solve? And then in our sales and our marketing, we had to agitate that problem. So people aren't paying attention to your brand. People are passing up your website. People aren't, to use your language, because I think it's accurate and I think it's very, very good, uh, they, they aren't connecting. And one of the reasons people don't connect is if we don't understand their problems. Mm-hmm. You talk about a guy who's going to be socially inept, talk to a guy who doesn't understand that anybody else has any kind of pain. You know what I mean? You're right. gonna, that, right. that's not, there's going to be zero connection. Right. So, uh, so I believe that... Uh, that's that's really the foundation is figuring out what problem do we solve, agitating that problem in the sense – by that I mean just talking about it mm-hmm. and making sure you're known for solving that problem. That's all sales and marketing. So to me – and clarity, right? Th- those are the things that if you want your business to grow, you've got to hyper-focus on those things. And what I see is – and, and you got to understand if you don't have a good culture, the whole thing's going to implode. Yep. Right. But you but the reality is you can also have an extremely good culture and go bankrupt. That's absolutely happens every day. Almost happened to me. 
happens amazing amount of times. And so it's like, look, you know, the, the, the culture is what happens when people stand around their fire and they put their hands out to warm themselves and they have a conversation. Guess when that doesn't work? When, when there's, there's no, no money. <laughs> <laughs> right, when there's no, no fire. There's no fire. There's no... So I'm like, look, guys, if you, you want to warm your hands, you got to make a fire. We'll, we'll, let's get, we'll talk about the conversation later. Let's, you know, and so that's kind of how I viewed that stuff. And I think, uh, um, and it's something I've had to say to the staff because we are an incredibly uh, culture-focused organization. And uh, that is not because of me, I confess. It's because I have a bunch of people who love each other and, and, ha- and I, get to, I get the joy and benefit of that. So I'm also always having to counterattack and say, you guys, culture is important. <laughs> there's a customer right outside that we're not talking to. <laughs> there's, there's money right there. And, and here's a shovel. That guy's going to be mad. You have to stop hugging if you're going to shovel anything, right? That's so great. I- I think the yin and yang of that of this conversation is critical. And when we get into binary, if we'll know this one's more important than this one, that's when you know it, they really almost like checks and balances. They have to keep each other in check. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I can I can speak to that really personally. In 2008, I almost went out of business. So I started my first business in 03. It was an automotive reconditioning business and we made cars look good for for dealers basically. And that grew from me in a van with no skills and a lot of enthusiasm. Um awesome. Right. And, and it grew to service a region. Right. And that business was actually eventually acquired um, in 2018. But that business grew to about 50 people. And in 2018, we were probably halfway there and um, and all the credit dried up. And I didn't know anything about business. I knew a lot about people and I was loving on people. And Capital One kept saying like, hey, you have a business. Would you like $20,000 on a credit card? And I'm like, yes. Oh, heavens, yeah. and, and, you know, I didn't know anything. I was just, and then my accountant who was like a small time accountant that I probably, you know, I probably walked into his little shop one day and said, I need an accountant. You're an accountant. And he said, at the end of the year, he's like, I'm kind of concerned about this number, you know, and he's like, well, it's a negative, you know, negative 20,000, negative 30,000, but I had cash and I didn't know any better. So I'm like, I don't know. How can I be out of money? I have all these checks, you know? Um, and so what eventually happened is in 2018, I got a rude awakening, which is what very necessary. And I realized that although I really started a business, I didn't even care about cars. I just liked serving people and working with people. And I realized very quickly that if there's no business, then there's no platform to care for people. And business is driven by revenue and profit. That's um, right. And, and it's not, those aren't bad words, you know? Yes. That's, I think that's hard for a lot of people to realize is that making a lot of money, you know, there are times when, when we've had, we've launched a product and it's done extremely well. And, uh, I've had trouble going to sleep at night hmm. because I'm, I'm like, is it okay to make, this much money? Is that okay? Right. And I've realized, I've realized like, wait a second, you need to stop. You need to stop that. That is a limiting belief. Uh, and what you need to do is have an organized plan on what you're going to do with the money that serves the world. Uh, and then that actually alleviate a lot of that. But, you know, I grew up dirt poor. I mean, we grew up in a project and standing in line for government cheese and rich people were bad. They were bad because the only way they got rich was to take advantage of others. So, you know, even though we serve our clients, well, there's part of me that goes, wait, am I taking advantage of somebody? Yeah. You know, and I, that, that's the way poor people think. Yeah. You know, everybody who thinks that way has one thing in common. They're poor. Yeah. No. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, <laughs> well look, I can really relate to this because I grew up in a- It's true. It's true. In a situation where I didn't know any business owners, um, very blue collar family, a lot of kids, small house, and I didn't know any managers, it, but it, it was always other people. It was always, oh, people like that, or it must be nice. And so I've had to deal with the same things. And even you saying that, you know, is, is also like start of alleviating that false belief in me. Like this is the part where I get free consulting. Um, yeah, uh, I have a great story. Go I, ahead. Love. I was in a city, I won't, I won't name names, but it was in a, a, a medium sized town. And uh, there was a very, very, very wealthy family who happened to be friends of mine. And they, they had bought funded a civic center for the town Mm -hmm. and we were going into the civic center and this acquaintance of mine said, you know, I'm not going to go in there that the name, that the last name is on that. And you know, they've, you know, they're rich and they've done this and and just went off on them. And I, I pointed across the street and I said, see that 25 story building. What do you think the name of that children's hospital is? (laughs) 
And are you not going to go? Are you not going to go into that building? Because they're they're saving kids' lives in that building. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 interesting to me how when somebody gets so far ahead of us, yeah. they become a villain. And I think that's our own jealousies and insecurities. And uh, and also, I think to, to to people who have made it, I think there is a responsibility to turn around for sure and help anybody they can or who hasn't. And when we don't do that, we are in fact guilty of some things that we need to address. But. Anyway, I think it's one of the things that, that stop a lot of business owners is they just don't they, they don't have a growth mindset. Yeah. My, my wife actually said to me this morning, you know, she said, you know, I'd be really happy with uh, if I were building a company, I'd be really happy with five employees and kind of capping it at this much. And uh, and she said, you wouldn't. And I and I said, I know. And it's not because I like money or I want a big company. I don't actually like money and I don't actually want a big company. I just don't know how to not grow. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Right. No, I understand. It's like that incurable curiosity, like that just lends itself to growth. That's exactly what it is. And the the number of things that growth makes possible is so fun. Yeah. It's, it's not fun. I mean, like people are wired a different way. Talk, talking about, um, what you do in the business world and that the business and growing is actually a good thing when it's leveraged in, in the right mindset. Um, you talk about, uh, this business made simple platform that you've recently launched, right? You've really had a renewed, it seems like a renewed um, desire to really edify and strengthen and raise up the middle class through yeah. like taking, giving empowerment and education for the skills that are like real life skills that if you have these and you walk into an organization, you're going to be much more valuable. Can you tell tell us a little bit about what it is and why you're doing it? Well, I think when I look back on my life, there'll be three phases uh, in terms of a professional career. The first will be um, a writing career, mm-hmm. memoir, uh, and wrote about eight books and, and loved, loved that life. It was I, I, I can't believe how much fun I have. But, uh, you know, if you write your eighth memoir, you're a clinical narcissist. So I needed to move on. To <laughs> <laughs> seven, you're like, once you go past seven. Yeah, once you go as uh, I mean, seven, you're just a narcissist, but clinical. Did is that have much. something to do with the timing of when you got married, by the way? <laughs> oh, I think so, yes. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a lot of unhealth that had to turn into health before I was compatible. It takes with a anybody. very caring person to be able to drop that news on you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then the second phase was, you know, I, I, tur- I leveraged the a knowledge of story into a marketing framework and started teaching people how to do marketing. And of course, I'm teaching business leaders that made my company grow. So we had to learn execution. We had to learn sales. We had to learn leadership. We had to learn management. We had to learn Mm -hmm. all of these different aspects of a business and, and then quickly discovered that all that we were learning was not really taught in college. Uh, and college is, you know, $50,000 a year Mm -hmm. or more to attend college, a good college or not a good college, but an expensive college. And, um, and I thought, man, I could teach you know, I'm getting these kids out of college and they don't know how to run a business. They, they literally, they, they studied a white paper on China or some Volkswagen ad in the 1970s and they, they don't know how to read a P&L. They can't run a meeting. They can't decide uh, on a mission statement and guiding principles. They don't know how to manage people. I've got to teach them everything. So we created Business Made Simple University, the online platform to teach business, especially small to mid cap businesses, mm-hmm. how to run business in a way that it's incredibly practical, very pragmatic, very easy to use and makes you money immediately. Mm-hmm. And then instead of $50,000, we'd started, we, we charge $275 because <laughs> I think it's a better deal. <laughs> and then, uh, so that will be phase two of my career. And, and we're sort of, I'm five years in, I'm going to go another eight to 10 years building that company. We will be a hundred million dollar organization within five years. We'll be $250 million within 10 years. Uh, that's the goal. And we, we've got a, you know, a, a framework and we're hiring the right people in order to accomplish that. That will effectively disrupt the university system and business schools everywhere. Cause I want to take every one of your employees to business school and, uh, and I want to grow the American economy that will then leverage into a third career, which will be a run for office. I don't know if it'll be Congress, Senate, what it'll be, but, uh, the, the but I'm already working on the, you know, and paying researchers to work on the, the, the platform of how do we actually grow the middle class? Mm-hmm. The middle class has taken a $10,000 pay cut since Richard Nixon. Mm-hmm. 
adjusted for inflation, they are making ten thousand dollars less. The average middle class family. So now, now they're making ten thousand dollars less, right? And then they're hit with three significant problems. The first is the cost of education. So you're making ten thousand dollars less, but you're starting with a quarter million dollar in debt, or hundred thousand dollars in debt, or That's whatever. That's a big you, swing when you take it. Ten thousand in cost of education. It's crippling. It's a swing. And then as soon as you get your professional career going, you are actually taxed more than Warren Buffett, because Warren Buffett's money is is in the is in Wall Street basically. Yep. yep. And they're taxed 11% only on what they pull out of the market. So they pull so little out of the market, they're effectively taxed less than 4%. You are paying 37. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, so now they're killing you in the tax code. And, and you say, well, Don, why is that? Well, the justification is money, capital on Wall Street creates jobs. So let's not, let's incentivize that rather than tax it. But that's assuming that you on Main Street don't create jobs. Right. So if you were taxed the way Wall Street is taxed, you'd be, you'd be taxed 4%. Now, I'm not for that because you'd have to shut down the government. But I am for raising it from 11 to 14, 15, 16, and lower years from 37 to 35, or giving you tax incentives to hire people. So if you hire somebody paying $75,000 a year, I'll give you a $150,000 tax credit. You know, I, I'm, I'm sad right now because it's going to take you, according to your plan, and you execute your plans really well, it's going to take you 8 to 10 years to get here. Well, but I'll start talking about it sooner than that, and then other leaders will be able to adopt those policies. But let me share really quickly yeah, the please. Tax, second place you're hit. The third place that you're hit is in is in uh, medical expenses. So as soon as you have a, a bit of money to spend, you, you're you're going to start having medical problems, and then the, then they're going to take your money that way. That's going to leave you no money to leave to your children. It's going to make it impossible for you to build wealth. Mm -hmm. So it's killing the American dream. And if we can just solve those three things, education equality, tax equality, and medical coverage equality, just those three things, my goal would be to get the, the average middle class family back their $10,000, in fact, a lot more than that, mm -hmm. and then create jobs on Main Street instead of Wall Street. And I mean, Wall Street too, but Wall Street's very, very, very important. Trickle-down economics is abs absolutely true. Mm -hmm. It's 100% true. It just needs to be adjusted so that it's more fair to the masses of Americans who need that. And the big enemy of all that is actually binary divisiveness between Republicans and Democrats. Because we are paying all of this tax money so that they can hate each other. Yeah. And, I, and I'm tired of paying for it. Yeah. I mean, that's that right there, I think. I grew up, I grew up in line, standing in line for government cheats. Okay. Five years ago, I started a company and now I pay a quarter of a million dollars every month to the United States government. Every single month I write that check. Mm -hmm. And what am I getting out of it? A bunch of people hating each other. Yeah. I want to pay for your fights. Yeah. Get along and get the work done. You know, so that's going to be my platform and it'll be eight more years before I'm, I'm willing to do that because I'm having a great time building a company. I'm providing too many jobs right now and I've got to build some sort of authority to, to get this message well, out. Well, I, th I think like you're, you're solving the first problem, right? This, that's what you're attacking. And, and, you know, even from, from my initiatives with this podcast and growing my agency and helping a lot of small businesses, and we have a big automotive vertical. So we work with a lot of auto dealerships across the country, um, which are in essence, most of them family owned small businesses. And, and, Very cool. and so, um, so in solving that problem, like one of the things that angle that I take, and I think you take this as well, you know, you have the business side and let, let's grow the business. The, the side and the angle that I, my audience serves and that I serve as well is trying to understand how to build something around that belief or around that brand. And I, brand is a misunderstood word, I think, commonly, commonly speaking. And, you know, we basically say um, brand is a feeling. It's the feeling that drives a buying behavior. It moves someone toward you or away from you, right? And you make, and brands make a lot of promises and they make, um, you know, they make a lot of uh, cool stuff sometimes, but the only effective brand is the one that helps you transact. And so uh, moving, moving down that th train of thought a little bit, what do you think are the most key elements for a small business to be doing with their brands in a time when now brand advice is all of a sudden coming from everywhere because everyone's in this pivot mode? Wh yeah. what, what do you think people should be doing when it comes to brand messaging, how they should approach it, what is tasteful, what is distasteful? Um, what would your, your hot take be on that? 
Well, I think that the colors we use, the logos we have, the music that plays in your your establishment, I think that stuff is incredibly important, but it's not actually what I do. What I do is anything that deals with words. Yep. And I think the, the, the two uh, streams of words that you use in your marketing and in your branding need to overwhelmingly communicate two things. The first is I care about you. Mm-hmm. I care about the customer. I care about your problem. I understand the problem. And you, you know all this already. And then the second one is I'm competent to solve this problem for you or help you solve this problem. Those are the two things that we need to be communicating all the time. I understand your problem and I'm competent to help you solve it. Uh, instead of my grandfather started the company and you know, all that kind of stuff. Here's that we our went, list of values. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. You know, those are great internal documents, yep. <laughs> external documents. Well, I like the words, right? Because like even coming, us coming to business is more meaningful when people connect on a human level, right? Getting to that center point without putting that into words, now we can't make decisions about what are our Zoom meetings like, right? right. How do we – and we, we have this um, – you know, they started out as values, um, but we've actually made them into our process so that we know them. And we, we take an approach of honesty – empathy, attention, connection, and care. And basically we say you have to know who you are and then you have to understand what's important to them. This is where story brand really fits in, right? Understanding what the brand script is. And then we have to get your attention because I can't connect until you stop scrolling into, and then connection, right? And that's where you understand. And then care is really, I think, kind of like what you just said is competence, yeah, because, and I would say to that that your 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 customers, your clients are in very good hands because yeah. those are all those are all things that and you, you start doing that stuff and your sales go up. Yeah, it, especially on especially on sales, you know, like auto dealerships where they're selling a car, they might sell a car to the same person every two or three years, depending on what you know to the same family, I should say, every two or three years. So you need that. You know, there's a CarMax dealership here in town that I'm fairly loyal to. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I just have had such good experiences with them, you know, and so I think that that uh, that that's super important. There's um, in in automotive when we started taking this approach to dealers who are very used to a tactical approach of marketing, and you know, people are like, well, I have to spend marketing dollars, so let me throw it against some algorithm or on search, and it's just a spray and pray. Maybe if I show you like the red car at the right second of your day, if I do it enough, like you'll happen to transact at that one moment. And and what we came in and said, well, and this was really informed by work we did with a brand script, is we said, let's put a picture of you up that says, that, and this is a dealership owner, and it says, people have been getting jerked around by car dealers for years. And he said, I don't want to do that. He goes, what if they think it's me? I was like, they already <laughs> think it's you. <laughs> and no, so right. to, to his credit, he let us put that statement on. Again, it was words. It was words. Um, and a picture. It wasn't an engaging. It was just a picture, right? It wasn't. It was an art. It was a picture, and yeah. people have been getting jerked around by dealers for years. And what usually costs the industry three, four, five dollars to achieve, we achieved for thirty cents. Like people actually transacted, bought a vehicle because they saw a statement that resonated with them and they believed in. Well, that's empathy. That's I understand your problem and your fear, and yeah. that that's a. That and and that you couldn't have written a better piece of copy for them. I mean, that's exactly what people are looking for. That's caring, right? It's caring, right? right. No, that's how I got my wife. Literally, she was dating somebody else, and I literally said, <laughs> "Listen, I got to tell you, I don't think you should be treated that way. I really wow. don't." And then I said, "In thirty days, I'm going to call you and ask you on a date, and I hope you don't have a boyfriend." And she didn't. <laughs> thirty days later, she didn't. That's an amazing. But it was story. empathy, right? Absolutely. You shouldn't be treated that way. <laughs> she was like, and she she believed that. She just never verbalized it. And yeah, then she knew. when you connected with that, she was like, yeah, like every great empathetic statement. Well, she, went home, she went home and told her girlfriend. She goes, you wouldn't believe what this Yahoo told me. She, she, he said, I shouldn't be treated that way. And they all went, you shouldn't. <laughs> He's right. What's his name? <laughs> Do you have his number? <laughs> right. Oh, fantastic. Um, Don, it's been so great just spending yeah, a few minutes so together. Fun. I love this conversation. Um, if you could, if you could look in the eyes of everybody that is going through this situation right now and tell them one thing, what would you tell them? Uh, it's going to make you better. It's your job to figure out how. Wise words, and I think they're true as could be, true as ever. Yep. Don, thank you so much. God bless. God bless you too. Talk to you soon. So, as you can tell, Don is a guy who. Well, he's Don now. He was Donald 
before the interview started, but now he's Don. So Don is a guy who is extremely driven um, and has really his, his life planned in phases, and he knows right where he is on the map in that phase. He knows right where he's at. So he has what I would say is clarity or perspective on where he's going and how what he's doing now ties into where he wants to be. And I think that that is a lesson we can all take away from this, whether you are an individual trying to, you know, improve your skill set or your situation or your income, whether you're a small business trying to figure out how do I run and, and what, how do I pivot? How do I retool in this time? If you're a large company, a leader of a large company, understanding the tools that you need to win in the next world, and that's, we're going to come out of this and it's not going to be the world we went into at the beginning of the pandemic my goal through all of it is that you have a little more perspective now. And and from his standpoint, like coming from Don, very educated and experienced perspective on how it is that we can move forward. And not only how it, you know, what we need to do to move forward, but our obligation as business owners, our obligation as leaders, our un- obligation as citizens to create opportunity. But Don says a lot of things in there that really helps us understand our obligation to one another to grow, to improve ourselves, to improve the lives of those around us and stay focused on the things that are going to keep moving us forward. So I hope you got as much as I did. I hope you will check Donald Miller's ecosystem out. I uh, He didn't, I didn't give him an opportunity to say how you could connect with him, but if you go to storybrand.com, storybrand.com, um, you will be introduced to the world of Donald Miller And uh, follow him on social media, Donald Miller. And uh, I hope you get as much value from your interaction or relationship with him as I did. And until then, I hope that you continue to deploy those tactics and especially the mindset that we are in a reinvention time period, that the transaction of growth that we're experiencing right now is actually a good thing. It's actually a blessing. We can't do anything to change the situation we're in, so we don't have a choice. But what you have a choice for every single day Day is what you are going to do with what you've been given. Today is day one. Have a great week. I hope you and your family stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Until then, pursue clarity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>